All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello again, uh, my name is Joey Hensler, um, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Uh, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, um, and thank you for attending today's program. The Dole Institute Student Advisory Board of, is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events just like this one, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you're a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. If you would like to know more about supporting the SAB and other Dole Institute activities, please contact our Director of Development, uh, Clarissa Unger. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. Before we begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the presentation, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come around with a microphone to help you. It's important that you have the microphone so our audio can pick you up for the video archive online. If you do not have a microphone, the archive will not have your question. If at any time during the program and you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or a student volunteer and they can assist you. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Will Banks, the Director of the Military History Department at CGSC. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. This is the tenth and a, a, uh, the third series and the tenth presentation of the series. And today we have uh, Dr. Sean Kalick, who's been with our department for ten years, and he is a Cold War historian with a PhD from K State. And since you have his bios, you came to hear him and not me. Without further ado, Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, how many of you heard of the Siege of Budapest or the Battle of Budapest prior to this? Oh, so there's a few at least, that's good. My, my intent today is not to get bogged down in details about troop movements and everything, but talk about the setup to the siege, the siege, the battle, and then the significance of the battle afterwards. So if you're here to learn about you know, the fourth panzer movement, ask a question, but I'm, I'm not that deep. I'm, I'm kind of a macro historian, so. Okay, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask. What I want to do first is set up the context of when and how this battle is setting up. So we'll kind of go through the Eastern Front because I think it's good to kind of look at what's going on on the Allied side, on the Western side of Europe, and then also look at what's going on on the Soviet side or the Eastern side of Europe. So I'll walk through what's going on with the Americans and the British. So here's some context, right? D-Day landings in June. Uh, U.S. troops are going to liberate Shoreburg in June 27, 1944, and then you can kind of walk through what's going on there, right? The, the Cobra breakout in August of 44. Then you see the Felia's Pocket, liberation of Paris. So you see how that war is shaping up on that front. And we tend to think of, at least being Americans, I think we tend to think the war's happening on the western side, but I mean, we tend to forget about everything out happening on the eastern side, specifically after Stalingrad. So everything's just happening great, and then all of a sudden the Soviets end up in Berlin and the war's over. But this is going to set the context that there's actually things going on simultaneously. In, in, Thinking about the decisive factor of this war or this battle, we need to think about what's happening on the west at the same time what's happening on the east. And then ultimately, the Siege of Budapest is also going to be ha taking place at the exact same time, or at least the end of it is going to be ta taking place as the Yalta Conference is going on between Churchill, FDR, and Stalin, which has some significance to why Stalin wants Budapest so significantly <laughs> and so fast. Okay, so everybody have the first half of the western perspective? Here's the second half, because the Battle of Budapest is actually going to start shaping up around November of 44. It became, uh, Malinovsky is going to get the, uh, the nod from Stalin to start planning the operation. It's going to kick off mid-November for the shaping operation to start coming into the plains of Budapest with uh, Tolbinkov's uh, army down from the south in, in Yugoslavia. Um, but the real siege is going to start happening around December, and it's going to finally culminate in January of 1945. So it's going to be about 100 days, believe it or not. So the whole operation about no, 1 November 44 is going to end around February 13th, 1945. And then the, cold, or the war is going to be over within three months after that. So it's pretty significant. 
Here's the Eastern Front perspective, which we tend not to focus on. And I apologize for the maps, but the best maps I could get are actually Soviet maps. And for some reason, their quality is horrible. I think it's probably reflective of the Soviet Union. I, I don't know. But you can see what's happening since essentially 42 on. They've pushed the Germans back. And I have some lines that will start focusing in on what's going on in Hungary specifically. So from 43 on, Stalingrad's ending, right? You start in Operation Citadel on the offensive at Kursk. You have, by mid-July, the, uh, the Red Army counteroffensive at Kursk, and which begins the push back from the uh, really apogee of Nazi kind of uh, advance into the Soviet Union. So what's happening from essentially July through really August is a significant push going on in the Soviet Union. You have a northern tier axis front going on, and then at the same time you have southern tiers going down through Romania, Ukraine, ultimately Yugoslavia. So you have a northern tier and a southern tier. What's going to happen for Budapest specifically in Hungary is you're going to have two Ukrainian armies, the second and the third Ukrainian armies coming down through uh, Ukraine here under Malinovsky, and Tolbrigov is coming up through essentially uh, Yugoslavia. At the same time, you have the northern armies doing their thing to get closer to Berlin and everything. So it's kind of a perspective that you need to focus on the whole theater, but in reality, we're going to be focused on this part right here, too. Okay. One other point to, to point out here is Romania, which is a, a curious element here, right? Um, 20, 20 August, right, you have the Red Army overran Romania and destroys the army group south in Ukraine. The significance of this is that it's going to force Romania out of the war on the Nazi side. So they get beat so bad that essentially they say, okay, Soviets, you guys are pretty good. Let's be on your side now. So what happens is that there's going to be actually a, a, the seventh Army Corps. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. We, we have a mic issue that we don't know about. Why are we just going seven? Good to go? Yes? That's better. Okay. We'll see if it when the video shows up online whether there's actually sound to it or not, right? All right, so we were talking about the Romanians getting knocked out of the war and then joining the Soviet side and fighting with the Soviets. And you're going to have the 7th uh, Romanian Corps, Army Corps, that's going to actually fight with the Soviets and actually take Pest. Uh, in the battle, and then once they take Pesh back from the Hungarians, and remember there's no great love loss between those two over this thing called Transylvania, uh, they're going to be relieved by the Soviets and say, hey, thanks for doing your duty. You were essentially bullet magnets for us. Now we can take over and, and clean up the operation. So that's pretty significant here because it's going to shift the tide uh, as far as who's aligning themselves with the Germans. Because once the Romanians are knocked out of the war, the Italians are already gone, the Romanians are gone, and now the only real ally the Germans have left in the East are the Hungarians, and specifically the Hungarian Arrow Cross Party, which are fascist thugs anyway. So we'll talk about how that plays into it as well. Okay? Questions on either front, West, East, and again, understanding how they're kind of working together I think is important. Okay? Here's the German lines as we go into Hungary specifically, which are pretty significant if you look at it. Budapest is right here. I wish I could point up there, but I'm just too short, right? So it's pretty significant. So you're about, you know, 60 to 70 kilometers away from Budapest, and there, you have significant rings at the south, in the east, and definitely on the north as well. And the west has significant protection as well. So if you're a Soviet commander, do you really want to take this fight? Remember, you're already moving through Transylvania, Romania, you have another Ukrainian force coming through Yugoslavia, and you have forces under Chuikov and those characters up north going through Warsaw across that plain. So is this a fight you really need to fight? No, you don't think so. So why is it so significant then? Which becomes part of the issue of you know, why does Stalin want it and why does Hitler want to hold on to it so bad? PR is part of it. There's also some significant... Uh, PR and the fact that if you're going into a Yalta conference, right, and if you're stalling and you're thinking about the long game, how to negotiate the end of the war, Budapest becomes a central 
a central jewel to hold in your, in your crown because you can say, hey, we hold everything from essentially, you know, Ukraine, Romania, Budapest. Budapest is going to leave you open to Vienna and then ultimately southern Bavaria. So if you have control of that swath of land, can you dictate some peace terms to Roosevelt and Churchill? And the answer is absolutely, right? Which becomes significant for Stalin. So Stalin is thinking at least politically about this. Now it's going to have significant combat power associated with it too, which we'll talk about in a few moments here. So not only is he thinking, hey, how do I end the war, but also how do I set the conditions for a peace that's appropriate for the Soviet Union to make sure they have a nice big security buffer after the war as well. And we'll talk about that at the end, the implications that it has for Hungary and Central Europe, okay? The Soviet lines of advance, which we've talked about a little bit, but this is a more specific map, and these are actually Soviet maps from the era. This is the northern tier up around the Baltic Sea. So you can see the significant action happening in the north. Budapest is this little operation down here. This map is essentially what's happening around Budapest, which is the center. So you see the elements coming down from Romania and then ultimately up through Yugoslavia, which aren't really well marked because they're about down here at this point. Okay? So again, you have to think about the amount of combat forces arrayed across the swath of Central Europe now. Essentially, you're fighting from the Baltic Sea all the way down to Yugoslavia, which is a significant front, right? This is a huge swath of Europe. So we're going to end up with about well, close to a million forces for the Soviet Union taking on Budapest, which is significant. It's a major diversion of forces to, to this region. Okay? The commanders of the Soviet Union. And again, I picked the, the top two commanders of the Ukrainian fronts. You have uh, Tolbukhin, Fedor Ivanovich Tolbukhin, known as the liberator of Belgrade. He's the guy who's coming up through uh, Yugoslavia. You have Rodin Malinovsky, who has just liberated Transylvania and knocked the Romanians out of the war. And he's been in significant contact with his forces since about July. And I'll talk about him and, because he's going to be the guy who's kind of in charge of the operation, specifically taking Pest. Uh, Tolbukhin is going to be in charge of taking Buda, and we'll talk about Budapest and the way it's arrayed and that river down the center. And then, just to make sure I didn't short shrift the Romanians, you have Nikolai Sova, who uh, becomes the overall commander of the Romanian 7th Army Corps. On the German side, and again, staying at the, the, at the macro level here, we have essentially three commanders. You have Karl von Peffer of Wildenbruck, who's going to, uh, who's going to command the 9th mountain core and he's going to be in physical command of the troops in and around Budapest. You have Ivan Hindi who is the overall Hungarian first corps commander who's in control of the major Hungarian troops that are there um, including police forces. They have university students who are actually fighting for them as well so you have a whole array of Hungarians there. And then Herbert Gilly on the side um, on the far side is the fourth SS uh, Panzer Division commander. His significance is that He's going to be in charge of the forces that come to try to liberate and break out the, uh, the siege of Budapest. The problem is there's going to have a significant problem with coming down from where he's in Warsaw, refitting after getting, um, getting shwacked by the Soviets as well. So he's going to have to come down and try to essentially break the siege. But the problem is, and I'll show later, that the, the front around the rear side of Buda is collapsing. And he's going to have to stop his advance because the southern tier... Of, this, of the Nazi line is essentially collapsing and he can't hold his position. So he has to be, get pulled back up north for that northern tier that's going across the top of the country. Okay? Questions on any of the commanders? All right, let me, uh, let me talk about force structure first. Well, let's talk about Budapest first and then we'll talk about uh, the force structures and then kind of the, the tail of the tape. Anybody ever been to Budapest? Or how many of you have been to Budapest? Probably you. Okay? City divided, two cities divided by a river, right? Now one city. But if you look at geogra geography, and this is, uh, I picked these pictures because I think they give a pretty good idea. Um, this is Heroes Park, which leads you into Millennium Square, which is a major square on the far side of the Pesh, which is about a mile and a half, two miles from the river, the Danube. Um, so if you're looking from Gellert here, essentially, or Citadel, uh, here through the Parliament building, this is probably about a mile or two off into the east. What's the terrain look like from that perspective? Pretty flat, right? So if you're marching across Europe, do you want that terrain? Yeah, absolutely, right? You don't want hilly, crazy terrain, right? Now the other side, so this, that's the Pesh side, which is going to be the 
pretty easy side. It's oh, sorry, is that the east side of the river? That's the east side of the river, all right? That picture's looking east. That picture's looking east from the hill, okay. all right? West side of the river. Uh, you have, so again, east side of the river. West side of the river. This is the citadel right across. And if you look, if you look kind of northwest this way, you'll see the castle district, which is where Pfeffer Wiedenbach's command bunker is. All right, he has an outpost here, but that's going to be just for recon and things. Um, the castle district right here, in fact, the parliament building right behind it is essentially the, his bunker. So you have a good command of Buddha. And then on the back side, it kind of slopes back. To the north, you have significant terrain, forest, hills. So the idea here is that you really have two different avenues of approach, but two different, um, two different terrain problems. Flat, easy to approach. This one, hilly, difficult to approach. And it's going to present issues for both the Soviets and the Germans. And we'll talk about the Germans as they try to build a, a breakout plan. And it leaves them very, very few <coughs> options because of the terrain involved specifically in Buda and specifically as the Soviets hold Pesh, which leaves you absolutely nowhere to go as far as flat, easy terrain, okay? Um, pretty significant elevation, by the way, from the river all the way up to the castle district. Uh, not easy to get up, uh, especially if you're fighting your way up. Uh, on the back side is gonna be an airfield that they're gonna try to use for resupply. They carved it out of a, of, of a park, which is about 800 yards long. We'll talk about how that uh, comes into play because as the Soviets advance around Budapest, there's going to be significant problems with getting supplies in and out of here, especially when your enemies are trying to essentially surround you and capture you, okay? All right, uh, before we get to approach, let me talk about some numbers here, which are significant, and I'll, and I'll just quote them. And to give up a straight up comparison, the third Ukrainian front, which is going to be controlled by Tolbukhin, is going to be about 450,000 forces, which is significant. And that's a huge number of folks to fight for this. And remember, that's just one, one approach. He's going to be in charge of the, uh, the Buddha side. Rodin Malinovsky is in charge of the second Ukrainian front. He's in charge of the, of the pest side. And he's going to have anywhere from 528,000 to 650,000. And the number varies depending on, on when you look at the, the operation. In fact, the beginning when he's sitting down in Transylvania and he gets the call from Stalin, and we'll talk about that in a second as well, he has about 528,000, but he tells Stalin, if you want this, I'm going to need more troops, by the way. And Stalin says, well, I'm not sure I can do that. And he says, well, if you want this, I need more troops, by the way. So, and I have a phone, a telephone transcript I'll, I'll read to you, which is pretty significant between those two, because it, it's, it's pretty funny in the way that Malinovsky is trying to get what he wants from Stalin, who seems kind of, no, it, don't you understand? I need it now. So, um, so, that, so between those two forces, you have, you're approaching, what, about a million people, okay? Now, as far as accoutrements of the 2nd Ukrainian Division, so what I'm doing here is you have the 3rd Ukrainian Division, which is 450,000. The 2nd Ukrainian Front is going to be 528 to 650,000. And I think the easiest comparison is to do the 3rd Ukrainian Front with the, uh, the Pfeffer Vellenbach forces in Budapest to give you a comparison to how they line up with one another. I'm keeping in mind that there's an extra 450,000 Soviets hanging out on the Buddha side, okay? So the second Ukrainian front has 10,000, well, about 11,000 guns, give or take, uh, about 4,000 mortars, 564 tanks and assault guns, which is significant, okay? Um, on the German side, and again, that's not counting what you have on the Buddha side with the third Ukrainian front. On the German side, you're going to have, and this is... 9th Mountain Panzer Corps, or I'm sorry, 9th SS Mountain Corps, and the Hungarian forces there. You have 127,000 Germans and Hungarians, so you have about a 4 to 1 Soviet advantage in troops, which is significant, right? Guns, you have about 2,800. Again, 4 to 1 favor of the Soviet Union. Motors, you have about 880, which again, about almost a 5 to 1 favor in the Soviet Union. And... Tanks and assault guns, you have a whopping 140, by the way, compared to 480 from the Soviets. So again, you have a 4 to 1 advantage. And if you think about modern military doctrine, right, what do you need to attack uh, entrenched defense, ratio-wise? 2 to 1? Do I hear 3 to 1? We hear 3 to 1, <laughs> right. 5 to 1. <laughs> 5 to 1 would be awesome, right? <laughs> Current doctrine is about 3 to 1, okay? But here you have 4 the lowest is four. The highest you're going to get is about 4.8, 4.7 to one. So this is pretty significant. And so Stalin must want this pretty bad, right? 
And if you're the Nazis, how are you feeling about this force array? Because again, remember that numbers I read are just for the front coming this way. I haven't calculated those yet, by the way, which is probably equal. So you're really probably about eight to one when all is said and done. Things aren't looking good for you right now, right? Okay. Let's talk about Stalin now. And then we'll get to the approach. Because Stalin's going to call Malinovsky in the field and essentially um, tell him what he wants to do, which is really take Budapest. And I, I'm not really a fan of reading things, but this is just too good to pass up. In fact, this is probably the best book on the Siege of Budapest. In fact, it was uh, written by a Hungarian historian, and it's been translated into English, and it's, it is, it's dense, thick, but ultimately fantastic. And I get to essentially do this book in, what, 40 minutes today? So... <laughs> But he, he, here's what Stalin's going to tell Malinovsky, right, the commander of the Second Ukrainian Front. Budapest must be taken as soon as possible. To be precise, in the next few days. Nothing like the boss's intent, right? This is absolutely essential. Can you do it? Malinovsky. The job can be done within five days when the 4th Mechanized Guard Corps arrives to join the 46th Army. So he's talking about, okay, I'm going to need some extra forces to do this, boss. Stalin's response, the Supreme Command can't give you five days. You must understand that for political reasons, we have to take Budapest as quickly as possible. Malinovsky, if you give me five days, I will take Budapest in another five. So, and this is interesting. So he's asking for 10, really, without saying I need 10 days. <laughs> if we start the offensive right now, the 46th Army, lacking sufficient forces, won't be able to bring it to a speedy conclusion and will inevitably be bogged down in lengthy battles on the access roads to the Hungarian capital. In other words, it won't be able to take Budapest. So essentially, I need the time for the 46th Army to show up. Stalin, there's no point in being stubborn. You, you obviously don't understand the political necessity of an immediate strike against Budapest. Malinovsky, I am fully aware of the political importance of the capture of Budapest. That is why I'm asking for five days. So he goes from 10 days to another five days, by the way. I expressly, Stalin again, I expressly order you to begin your offensive tomorrow. So if you're Malinovsky, you have your work cut out for you, right? You know the forces, you're going to need the 46th Army, you're going to need at least five days to prepare, refit, because again, you've been fighting almost nonstop since July. And this is the beginning of November of 44. So you know that Stalin really wants Budapest. You know it's an entrenched uh, SS mountain division. You know they have significant defenses around. Do you want to take this, this on lightly? The answer is no. All right. Can you do it in five days? Which is, it seems pretty significant. Oh, yeah, I can do it in five days. But if you give me another five, I can really do it this time. Now, the other idea is that you have another supporting army coming up the back that's going to help you out with that. And I don't, there's no record of Stalin calling Tol Bukin and telling him the same thing. Hey, I need two days out of you. So you don't have com competition. What you have is pretty good coordination between the two. All right? All right. What's going to happen now is as we build the approach is that Malinovsky is going to start the attack. And in the first day, he's going to essentially on 1 November... He's going to, well, this is really about, he gets two days, so 1 November is a phone call, do it tomorrow. He actually starts on 3 November, so he takes a day from Stalin, which is pretty bold. Um, he's going to essentially be able to break through those defenses that we saw. He's going to be able to penetrate 70 miles in the first day, which is significant. So if you're, you know, feeling pretty good, that's pretty significant, right? Because this is about a 60-mile front from Budapest here. So 70 miles is going to put you, so he's starting about here, by the way, from, from this avenue of approach. So it's going to put you right around the outskirts of Budapest, about 18 uh, miles from the river, which looks pretty good, right? I mean, one day, 70 miles, that's, that's phenomenal, right? This should be a cakewalk. <coughs> and you're not even linking up with your buddy who's coming around the other side of the river yet, who's making equally significant progress, correct? So great. Um, so again... 70-mile break, things are looking pretty good. By 21 December, Tolbukhin in the 3rd Ukrainian Front, let me go back to the, to the approach, um, have seized the Budapest of Vienna Highway, which is a critical artery to, for the Nazis to funnel uh, reserves into, into the region. So this is going to be cut off. So within, what, six weeks of the operation, now you have the Soviets up in this area, cut off access to southern Bavaria and Vienna. 
you have the second Ukrainian front on this side pushing on the front door of Hungary as well. Uh, by two, two days later, and again, the timing of this is significant because essentially every day or two you have significant advances happening. So within, from you know, 3 or 4 November to December 23rd, you're now having Budapest essentially being quickly sealed off and kind of strangled by the second Ukrainian front and the third Ukrainian front. The weather in November, December is, is cold, but not horribly cold yet. That's going to hit around January when the sea starts to happen, and it's going to have a significant impact on people getting water and that type of stuff. But it's not, it's not Stalingrad-esque or anything yet. It's just kind of your standard Central European December weather. And by the way, have all these bridges over the Tesh been blown up? Are they all they haven't been blown yet. They have not. Yes. They will get all blown soon. And that's going to happen beginning of January, essentially. Well, interesting. Um, the Germans have some aircraft, uh, but they're going to get pulled off because you have significant um, allied intervention happening in and around Germany. So the idea is, well, they have some fighters, but the Soviets can handle them. So the Soviets, by end of December, beginning of January, end up controlling the air pretty significantly. And in fact, in that Citadel I showed, um, they, have, they have a museum in there now, and there's a little placard in there that says something like, you know, the American and British people love the Hungarians so much that they never bombed us during World War II, which is like, well, well, not really, but uh, okay. But the Soviets did their fair share of bombing, so. But it, it, yeah, a good question, because air, air assets, uh, they fly a lot of Stormovic kind of ground attack stuff to help dig out the, uh, uh, the Nazis and the Hungarians. So to use ground attack, you need air superiority, and they have it. Transport. transport as far as? Uh, in a week, I'm sorry, did I say I meant in a week? I apologize. Uh, motorized, and then you're walking it, buddy, if you're infantry, yeah. So there's so. no rolling stock, there's no trains, I know the gauges were no, different, right? Right, and essentially this is a, a, a mechanized, motorized movement in, right? You may have some trucks and stuff bringing up, bringing up um, logistical supplies and everything, but most of the stuff is move, move, move. And the Soviets... They like to essentially, you have infantry and armor working together. So lots of times, if there's no contact, what you see is infantry riding on armor. So, you know, you get a little hitchhiker. So that'll help you save a few miles or so. So that's, yeah, you're not rolling. You're not moving troops railroad, you know, hundreds of miles. You're essentially, you're fighting or walking, rolling the whole way. Good question. All right, by 23 December, uh, Budapest is now essentially pinched by two elements within the second uh, Ukrainian front and the third Ukrainian front. Um, interestingly, on the 24th of December, the first group that's going to kind of contact, so what it's, what's happened is that, remember this nice, active, rare, uh, spread out defense? It's now essentially going to be consolidated around Budapest. So it's essentially within, so this is October to December 30th, by 30 December, it's going to be collapsed essentially around here. You're going to have some elements down here, some in the north, and we'll see those later in January as Giles tries to push through with his Panzer Division to try to break the siege. This is going much faster than I expected it to go. I think I'm going to run out of time. All right. Here's a siege, right? So essentially what's happening by 24 December, you have Soviet armor and recon units pushing up to the castle district, which is where the command center is. So the Hungarian police force, who are being used essentially as a screen and reconnaissance force, panic, and they go to meet the Soviets out around this district. Anybody want to guess what happens to them when they meet an armored reconnaissance unit? They get decimated, right? And... The Germans start to say, well, maybe this is pretty significant, but the idea is, no, 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 they're still about, you know, five, ten kilometers away, and they still have to fight uphill. So the Germans will control the high ground. We don't need to panic yet because, yes, they're coming closer, but the Hungarians will essentially be cannon fodder for us, so we'll let them panic until things come down to um, what we need to do, all right? At this point, uh, Hitler's going to order Gilly, the 9th Panzer, or I'm sorry, 4th Panzer Division commander, to deploy his forces to Hungary to, to help break the encirclement. So what's happening is that 
You, remember that northern tier I talked about? You have significant um, Nazi forces engaged up there, so he's going to pull forces from that to, to break out the encirclement. But again, if you look at a topographical map, and I apologize, I don't have a good one, this up here is essentially all hilly wooded terrain. So you can't break the siege from up here because tanks just can't go uphill through woods pretty easily, right? Which is, at least we assume that through the Ardennes too, right? So they have to come down, and we'll, we'll look at that as we talk about January, because that's when the real break's going to happen, all right? So essentially, by the end of December, you have Hitler who's starting to kind of panic and say, okay, let me start pulling forces to try to help break the encirclement. It's not a siege yet. It's just it's starting to get ringed off and starting to get a little tense. But, you know, of course, an SS Panzer Army unit can break the siege, which we'll talk about how that goes pretty, pretty shortly, okay? On 29 December, the Soviets want to force this issue because remember Stalin wanted it in how many days? Five days. And now we're all pushing the end of December already, so you don't want to make the Generalissimo mad yet, right? Because he can still make your life miserable. Um, so what the Soviets do, Malinovsky specifically, he's going to send two, two Soviet officers to go convince the Germans they need to surrender. He's going to send Mikko Steinmetz and Ilya Ostapenko. And the idea is you send them with white flags to say, hey, okay, you guys know the situation. Here's where we are. We, we've cleaned up some of your Hungarian units. We've had the, we have the city in its ring. Do you want to surrender now? Anybody want to guess what the Germans are going to say? No, they don't say nuts. No, that's on the other theater, right? But, but, but good, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we'll talk about that. Hold on. So they say no. No, not only no, but nine, right? And then you have Steinmetz and um, Ostapenko go away. And, and this is where there's some debate on what happens. The original interpretation is they start to leave, and one of the Germans gets an itchy trigger finger and shoots him, and everything goes crazy, and they both end up kind of dead, which is, which is very convenient if you're a Soviet, because then you play the propaganda of you know, the Nazi Nazis, and they're doing heinous things when we're just offering a branch of peace. Latest scholarship seems to indicate that the car they're riding in actually rides over a landmine. And they hit the landmine and it's no, no good. So then that's going to create some confusion and people start shooting. Anyway. Which, and in Russia, you still play, you still play the propaganda piece. Somebody shot them. So it's the view of being in a dictatorship. You don't have to worry about the truth. You just manufacture something that fits. By the way, did you say Steinmetz? Steinmetz. So how's a Russian guy with a German last name? Well, his, his, he's actually Hungarian. Uh, his mother is Hungarian, his father is a Soviet, or vice versa, and they're, dead, they're steadfast communists from 1919. Because Hungary goes through a brief kind of communist flirtation period in 1919, ends up moving to the Soviet Union, becomes a martyr after this, by the way. In fact, for the communist era from 46 on, there's, there are, there's a significant statue to Steinmetz, which has since been moved off to uh, the statue park because he's a communist. So yeah, but good question. So that doesn't go, down, uh, the, the, uh, doesn't go down the way the Soviets expected to go down. So now we're going to have to fight for it. So this is when the siege is actually going to begin. So that you have the third Ukrainian front from Tobukin. It's going to be very close to Gellert Hill and the Castle District. And you can see the ring now they have around the Buddha side. You have Malinovsky in the second Ukrainian front now essentially sealing off the Pesht side from the <coughs> north all the way down. So... Those of you that have been there, you know, Margaret Island, just north of that is going to be contained, and then all the way down south where you have the split in the river where you have a tributary coming off. You have control of an outer ring and an inner ring, and the idea is you use those rings interchangeably. So if you're getting pinched on one side, you can transition forces from outside to inside or inside to outside, depending where you need to plug a hole or exploit a gap. And you can also transfer some from Buda to Pesht if you need to, but the problem is you still have to cross a river, which becomes increasingly more problematic. So... From an operational perspective, it seems like they have everything kind of figured out. They're not, they're not under significant threat from, from a Soviet breakout, except for Gao, who's going to show up pretty soon here in, in January, but we'll talk about that. But you're getting set for essentially the street-to-street -street fighting that's going to take place and the actual siege to Pesht and Buda. At this point, the Germans start thinking about okay, if we have to have a contingency plan and we have to leave Buda and Pesht, what we'll do is we'll consolidate everything at the Buda to the headquarters, and then they have two options. The breakout of this is going to go north, and this is going to become essentially Operation Conrad and feeding into it. You either go north or you go south. 
The problem is, I already mentioned, what's the terrain like up north? Difficult. Difficult. Hilly, woody, and you don't want to do that, especially if the Soviets have essentially tried to seal it off. So, being great military commanders, your first course of action is a non-course of action. Your second course of action is, let's go south, which becomes a course of action if they're going to need to break out. Now, what's, what's interesting is when we talk about the breakout, which is going to happen, it's neither north or south, it's kind of this way. It's kind of almost a split in the middle, but then again, things are getting pretty crazy by the end. Okay? <clears throat> at, at this same point, we're talking about three days later, so you're about into January 1st now. Giles forces are actually crashing into Soviet forces out here. And they're going to make about a 30-kilometer penetration into this structure. So they're going to be about 18 miles from the, the Buddhist uh, suburbs, which is significant. So you have this kind of, as you're getting set up to kind of, you know, strangle the, the Nazis, you have this panzer force coming down from Warsaw to essentially break through a line. But what happens, and let me show, where's my, this map. This map here, um, what's going to happen is here's the 4th Panzer Corps here. They're going to make it to about 18 miles outside of the suburb, and then they're going to have to stop because this ring down here is already going to collapse. And this is one of your safety ideas that can allow, allow you to escape down south. So the idea is it's going to be a pretty significant um, impact for Malinovsky and Tolbukhin, but the idea is luck kind of comes on your side that you can put pressure down here as this front starts to collapse. Giles has to stop and help support these guys. So essentially luck's on your side because they're not going to be able to penetrate any further, and you're going to be able to squeeze... Um, the Nazi and Hungarians in, in Buda. All right. Um, this is the counterattack, right? The Soviet rings are now set up. The siege is going is to essentially start now. So the first siege, right? Now there's an issue here. You have about... You have civilians trapped here, by the way. Um, part of the issue is that as... As the war is taking shape, and for Budapest and for Hungary specifically, you have lots of Hungarian uh, country folk moving to Budapest because they believed it was safe. And up to this point, it's been relatively safe. It's been one of the few cities that's kind of left untouched by the Nazis and their their crimes, specifically the the, the Jewish community too, which is about 140,000 Jewish members in, or Jewish uh, people in in Budapest. So what you have is essentially about um, I think there's about a million people flowing into Budapest on the civilian side, on both sides. So as the siege starts to take off, you have a significant civilian population that's going to be stuck there. As the winter gets worse, as supplies get worse, as the Danube freezes over, so getting water becomes dangerous. Uh, the only savior for food becomes these animals right here called horses. There's about 20,000 horses in Buda and Pest that aren't able to escape, and they become quick supply barbecue, barbecue for... Uh, for the people, which is significant, right? Now the other issue here is that if you're Germans and you're fighting an entrenched defense, what do you need more than anything? You need infantry, but what do infantry need more than anything? They need mortars. They, they need ammunition and supply, right? So if, if the Soviets have sealed this off, how can you get supply in? River or fly it in? Fly it in is the first idea, but the problem is the, the one airfield's down here, the airport, it, it gets seized. They carve out, again, it's a park right back here. It's 100 kilometers long. And if you look at Google Earth today, you see the Castle District, you'll see a nice big long rectangle on the backward slope, the western slope of Castle District. That becomes the impromptu airfield, which works well until this inner ring gets close enough to the Castle District to shut that down. At that point, you're going to send barges down the river. The problem with that is the Soviets are starting to you know, pinch closer and closer to the river, so you're going to have to do it at night and under fog. And the problem is you're using you know, barges, essentially. It's wintertime. They get stuck on sandbars. If there's any light or moon, they're easy to see, and the Soviets can interdict them. And then by mid-January, the river's going to freeze, so no more barge traffic, by the way. So air traffic's out of the question. Barge traffic's out of the question by mid-January, so you're left with essentially what you have there, which is pretty dire. Eleven January, Stalin's pressing Molinovsky now. He's going to say, essentially, listen, I gave you five days. We're, it's now 11 January. What I want you to do is I want you to steamroll everybody that's in front of you. 
So bring your heavy artillery, bring your tanks, and just do what you need to do and push to the river. Easy for him to say, right? But he's the boss, okay? And Malinowski is going to listen. So by 7 January, actually the Soviets have captured Pesh. They fight, there's significant resistance. You can see the guns train. There's a, a German gun there, and then there's some anti-air. Uh, here's a siege taking place. Uh, part of the heavy artillery that the Soviets bring in are the Katusha rockets. So essentially you park these in the outside ring and you just let them fly and essentially decimate the area. Uh, you also are going to send in your Romanian allies to essentially be bullet magnets for the Hungarians and the Nazis. And then the Soviet forces are going to go in and clean up and essentially control the area. So when Stalin gives the order within, so the order is given on 11 January, take it now. Uh, within six days, Malinovsky has seized essentially the Pesh side up to the river, which is good, but the problem becomes now, where's the high command? It's on the back side on Budo, so now you have to do that operation as well. Again, remember, there's two moving pieces to this operation. At this point, the Germans start thinking about an escape, finally. And again, uh, Pfeffer Wollenbach has asked Hitler twice now if he could leave. And the answer, as, as per Hitler tends to do, is no hold in place, by the way. Because what's significant is that last ally, as I talked about, and also the last major strategic oil reserves are actually in Hungary as well. They're actually down south and around here, essentially. So if he gives those up, if he, he believes if he gives up Budapest, he's going to lose access to those oil fields, which he's quickly going to lose anyway. Uh, so he tells Peff and Wallenbach, no way. Well, back now, by mid-January, is starting to realize that this is getting to be a pretty dire situation. The um, Tolbukhin and his forces are up on Gellert Hill now, which is right here. In fact, those of you who have been to Budapest, you have the Gellert Hotel at the bottom of the hill. You have the big hill on top. The Citadel I showed is, is essentially the top of Gellert Hill. There's a big monument there now. You can see the castle district from there. It's about a 15-minute walk today, um, but you're going to have to fight your way over there. So the Germans start thinking about, okay, how do we plan a breakout? And you can see the blue arrow becomes the breakout. It's not really north, it's not really south, it's kind of in this direction, which is where that fourth Panzer Corps is kind of holding just in case they're going to need them after they've assisted down south. They've taken the pressure off here, they're going to come back up and um, try to relieve. <coughs> um, 24 January, the Germans are going to counterattack to try to relieve pressure on Buda. So again, they're going to try to counterattack across the river into Pesh to take some pressure off. They're also going to try to put some pressure here to pull pressure in the western direction. So they're trying to do everything they can to relieve pressure on essentially the castle district, which is the last bastion of control for the Nazis. Uh, the relief force has to stop because, uh, again, as I talked about, southern flank and Giles can't do what he needs to do. And they run into significant Soviet resistance because again the Soviets have are now bringing in heavy artillery they're bringing in tanks they're bringing in infantry and they've control they can now control all these access they control the islands uh, and they're starting to push up the control here so anything you try is essentially a desperate measure because you're limiting your supplies you're losing your supplies and they're getting stronger and stronger and more condensed so essentially they're just strangling you slowly <coughs> What's interesting here is that on 10 February, uh, the Soviets are back on the offensive and they're going to actually capture Gellert Hill. So you're about three days away from the end of the battle now. So um, let me see. Gellert here, Hill is here, Castle District there. So it's going to take them three days to fight from here to there, which is significant. So at this point on the 10th, when they have Gellert Hill, is when Peff and Wallenbach starts talking about the breakout and the escape. And the idea is, okay, you can't do it at day because you're, it's going to be, you're going to get killed. You're going to have to do it at night, and you want to go out essentially in three forces. So you kind of split them, so you kind of all draw fire from different ways, and, you know, essentially good luck, good luck, good luck on your own break. Um, yeah, see you in Berlin if we can get there, right? Or if we can link up with some of our armor buddies in the, in the back. Three waves are going to try to break out. It's, luckily, it's a dark, foggy night. About 10,000 people are going to try to break out, which is significant. Only about 780 I'm sorry, yeah, 780 are going to make it. So you have 10,000 who are going to try to break out and leave the headquarters. Uh, three, three division commanders are going to end up dead. Peff and Wallenbach are going to end up getting um, seized by the Soviets as he's trying to climb out of a sewer in, in a Budapest suburb, by the way. And 
What was that? Are these guys all on feet? I mean, are these, are they are they all on feet. Yeah. Gas no, gas no, gas they're gas they're gas they're hoofing it out. Okay. In fact, the, the fighting that these three axes encounter is pretty significant because it's essentially you have some Panzerfausts, right. you have some machine guns, you don't have really any artillery support, so it's essentially hand to hand fighting okay. uh, against Soviets who have no great love. Now, what they find out is that if you, if you do this at night, and the Soviets have kind of been allowed to take villas and things that have large caches of alcohol, the Soviets will be drunk and groggy in the morning. So it's the best time to attack the Soviets when they're drunk and groggy, which is a learning organization, right? Attack your enemy when you can't fight your back. So don't drink and fight wars. It's not a good thing, right? 11th February, uh, Pefa Mullenbach is going to direct the breakout. And this is the exact same time that actually FDR and Churchill are meeting at Yalta to start having dinner and start discussing the actual... Uh, political discussion at Yalta about the end of the war, right? I, I talked about uh, uh, you have 10,000 trying to break out. The end result is 785 is the actual number that actually make it out, which is pretty significant. So the aftermath of the losses. So now by 13 February, the Yalta conference is, is ending here. In fact, I, I like to think that Stalin's saying, hey, guess what? I just took Budapest, by the way. And he's like, what? I just took Budapest. Right. He, he can't take Budapest, right? I want Budapest. Um, some historian humor? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the losses are, are significant. So you, you have Stalin, who's now in control, a, a major chunk of Central Europe. And the losses become significant, right? The Germans are going to lose um, about 70,000. 110,000 are taken prisoner, by the way, uh, which is significant. And, and prisoner in the Soviet context is UL. You're either going to end up in the gulag, forced labor, or you end up dead. So, um, you know, fate's on your side. The Soviets are going to expend, and Soviet numbers are hard to get, by the way, as they are throughout the war. So the numbers are going to range from 100,000 to 160,000. So this is a pretty significant element. So if you start off with a million, you're going to lose about 10% of your total force, which is significant, but you have it now. And again, if this is an attritional fight, you're at least, you know, kind of matching what the Germans are losing. Civilians, 40,000 civilians are going to end up dead. 20,000 Jewish um, people are going to end up dead because what happens is as that noose is closed around the, the Nazis and the Arrow Cross Party, which is essentially the Hungarian Nazi Party, those, the Jewish ghettos that have been set up for uh, the Jews in Hungary are, are now being kind of raided by the Arrow Cross Party and they're taking Jews down to the river and shooting them in the back of the head. They're killing them kind of last ditch effort. The Arrow Cross Party are nothing but a bunch of thugs, essentially. So in the last days of the war, uh, or the siege, they're, actually, they're essentially trying to do whatever they can to liquidate as many Jews as they can. So they end up killing um, the better part of 20,000. Um, now, so that's kind of the end of the battle, right? Pretty significant fight. Now, the discussion here is supposed to be on decisiveness, right? So why is this decisive? And here's some of the aftermath. The legacy. And why is this decisive? Well, significantly, what happens after the siege is that to control those avenues to oil and to maintain as ally, Hitler's going to essentially send about one-third of his total panzer units down to Hungary. So essentially, if we think about what's going on on the Western Front, which is those first two slides, a major element of armor power is going to be concentrated and contained in Hungary. In fact, about about a month after the siege of Budapest, um, the Germans are going to launch their last major counteroffensive in the east into Hungary to try to retake elements to, to maintain access down to the oil fields, which it fails. And again, if you think about, you know, a third of all armor, panzer power held in, in that front, good thing it's not up on the, the western side because that makes it a much difficult fight. The decisiveness, I think, is that part as well, that it takes significant pressure off the Western Front. So essentially, it's a good example of how these two fronts play off one another throughout, throughout the war. And finally, kind of working the way Stalin wants it in, kind of in, the, in, the, in the American perspective. The significance for the, from the Hungarian side, though, is pretty dicey. Because as I talked about, there's the Arrow Cross Party, which is a fascist element, and there's a strong kind of communist element in Hungary, too. Then there's a strong democratic sentiment. So you have kind of three splits. They're very, very happy with the Hungarians for the communists to come back, to essentially get rid of the Nazis. But the problem is the communists still want to leave. So what happens is that you're going to have a process where the Soviets are going to raise these fantastic statues. You know, this is, this is on top of Gellert Hill, by the way. 
you can see it wherever you are in the city, built by the Soviets to commemorate the liberation. Liberation in quotes. On this side, which is probably one of my f more, f more f um, favorite statues, is defeating fascism. It's just a guy beating the bejesus out of a hydra, which is awesome. So it's, it shows how awesome the Soviets are, right? So you have this iconography, you know, hey, we're your liberators. And what happens is that the Soviets, as I said, they transform Hungary to essentially a communist state. It becomes one of their crown jewels with Prague um, in the post-Cold War environment. So the tension you have within Hungary is, okay, we thought we were going to get liberated. The problem is we've been liberated, but now we're being forced to be communists. So the decisiveness isn't necessarily the war effort. I think the decisiveness, being a Cold War historian, is the Cold War aftermath in the, in, in the sense that it creates significant pressure within Hungary. You end up with the 56 revolution, where you have forces saying we don't want significant communist power. The Soviets are going to clamp down with other Warsaw Pact forces that come in and crush the rebellion. And throughout the history of Hungary in the Cold War, there's always this tension with, are you really a democratic power or are you a communist power? And, and society is essentially split. There's, a, law, there's a, a historic strain from at least 1848 that we're good Democrats, by the way. We'll try to break away from the Austro-Hungarians, we want to follow our own path, and now we're under the yoke again of the Soviets. So you always have this tension, which is going to prevail until 1990, when the last Soviet forces get forced to leave, and it's a big celebratory moment. Today, if you go to Hungary, the significance of the decisiveness is this monument is completely expunged of any Soviet iconography. And they, all the stuff that was written on it's gone. The only remaining statue throughout Buda and Pest is this one right around the American embassy, which has a fence line around it because people have been essentially uh, vandalizing it. All other Soviet monuments have been moved well outside Budapest. In fact, if this is Budapest, the, the, they call it Statue Park. It's out here, and they've kind of stuck everything out there as a good museum, you can go walk around and see all the good Soviet stuff. So the legacy is that after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, they've completely stripped themselves of this Soviet history. So the history then depends on, you know, were they liberated or not? And the prevailing trend now is, well, you were liberated from Nazi power and the Arrow Cross power, but then you had to suffer under the yoke of the communists for the better part of 50 years as well. So decisive really on the political side and the fate for Hungarians. Militarily, it's going to relieve significant pressure off the Western Front and become a critical part. And again, it ends up being about a 30, well, about a 100-day siege, which we tend to forget about. We tend to look at Stalingrad, maybe Leningrad, and we forget about this. But at the end of the war, this is happening in January. The war is going to be over within three months. So it takes significant pressure and pulls significant resources from the Nazis to fight this fight. Questions or comments? Sir. Two questions. First of all, could you speak a little about the intelligence, military intelligence, on both the Russian side as well as the German side? And then secondly, what are the military lessons to be learned from this battle? Let me handle the first, the intelligence one first, and the second one I think I can handle pretty quickly. Um, Intelligence-wise, as the Soviets are setting up for the fight in that approach, the, um, the Germans have fantastic aerial reconnaissance, and they can kind of get a good sense of what's coming. But the problem is, if you, if you can't be allowed to retreat, you can know what's coming, you can think you can fight it, but the problem is you're facing a four-to-one ratio. So you have the intelligence, but the problem becomes you know it's going to be an ugly, ugly fight. The Soviet side... You have pretty good intelligence on what's in Budapest, uh, but you don't know what's going to be sent from where, so you're kind of planning to contingency on you know, what you need to do, which is why the Soviets just you, you throw a million men at them, that's all. You can overwhelm whatever you need to. So uh, that's kind of the level, and I don't know point to point kind of you know, what, what they're doing as far as probing the city and everything like that. The second point, as far as military lessons, if your military... If, and this is probably more on the political side. If your military commander asks you to retreat, you probably say yes, because you may be allowed to you know, have them fight another day. Uh, maybe you send the 4th Panzer Corps down earlier to help relieve pressure. If it's that significant, you know, throw more forces at it. But again, you, you don't have that many forces left, by the way, so you're being slowly attrited. Uh, on the Soviet side, the military lesson is, well, the way we fight wins. It's about the steam, big steamroller effect, right? More power, you throw people at it, heavy artillery, tanks, aircraft, 
combined arms. You can do whatever you need to do. It's going to be bloody, but you can do it. They've learned this lesson, this is like the third time now. Just keep doing it, as long as you have people. The, excuse me, did the Russian forces that took Budapest, were they involved in ultimately making it to Berlin? Uh, no, that's the southern tier, or the northern tier units okay. end up so with that. So these guys didn't end up... No, they end up again in southern Germany. Gotcha, okay. Right, okay. Yeah, they don't get the glory of sitting on the Reichstag. Gotcha, okay, cool. <clears throat> you know, it's, in, it's, coincident, or it's interesting that uh, the end comes just as, at the time of the Yalta Conference. And as you know... There was this Declaration of Liberated Peoples right. to which St Stalin signed up that, that pledged that there would be re opportunity for democratic or self-determination right. democratic regimes. So this is all entirely cynical, as we know. <laughs> but what did the Allies think of, think of that at the time? I mean, uh, did, I, they, did they seriously believe that? You know, in, in looking at some Cold War stuff, it seems, it seems that FDR kind of believes, yes, Stalin's going to allow this to happen. But there, there's a fantastic book called, uh, I think, Rebuilding Hungary or something, like The Communist Takeover, which was done a few years ago by Oxford. And it's a fantastic example of how the Soviets kind of move in. You play the, uh, we're allowing political elections game, because and, and you could show the allies, see, we're holding up to our bargain. But the reality is, you're setting the whole conditions, so it, the result's going to be the communists are going to win every time. And it, it includes liquidating people, you know, making sure people disappear, shaping the environment, propaganda. So FDR kind of dies, and you know, Truman isn't a big fan of the Soviets. So I think FDR believes he can kind of bring Stalin into the fold. I'm not sure he could have, though, if he lived. I mean, Stalin, Stalin, Stalin's very good at playing this political game, telling you what you want to hear, and then shaping the environment to get what he wants. I don't think Churchill believes it, though. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious about the breakout effort. If I understood you to say there were 10,000 people involved in that of maybe 250,000 German troops under siege. So who organized that and what were their hopes? They, it was Peffin and Wallenbeck and his staff. His staff organized it and their hope is they could just break out of the, the pincer and, lock, and, and link up with some German element to fight another day. And get everybody out or were they? Well, no, only 10,000. I mean, so it's 10,000 people, 10, people to get out, right? Because the Hungarians aren't going to leave. I mean, it's their city, right? So it's, it's pretty dismal. Especially the numbers that end up, you know, 110 captured, that's, that's significant. So, yeah. And, and your hope is maybe we could break out. Maybe. Uh, during the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was a large uh, university student uh, population that they was involved it, in right. that. And uh, I'm curious as to, since the Soviets were so adept at at crushing and repressing the intellectuals, how, what was the impetus for that student revolt? Who, who was their... Uh, well, you know? the impetus is that they're, they're getting bombarded with kind of free, Radio Free Europe and propaganda, right? And there's, there's a strong Hungarian democratic strain, as I mentioned, from 1848 on. And the idea is that as you're learning about your Hungarian history, but you're being suppressed by the Soviets, well, we want more say kind of just like 1848, we want more say in our, in our um, self-determination. So that starts the movement going, and the idea is the Soviets are there, they're occupying you. This is no different from the Nazis, by the way. So that kind of fuels a movement, and th there's significant street fighting going on. I mean, it, it, it really is a revolution. They're trying to get it going, but it doesn't, it doesn't have much power against Soviet and Warsaw Pact tanks and um, infantry. Sir? Uh, was there ever uh, an attempt by the German generals to really uh, convince Hitler to withdraw before the siege and to set up maybe a better defense and conserve some forces? Um, not that I'm aware of, because again, getting all the way back to Stalingrad, right? Hitler issues the order of, of no retreats essentially after Stalingrad happens. So he's not going to sacrifice one capital of Central Europe, which is kind of the delusional mindset of Hitler, right? I mean, military, you probably could abandon it and set up a stronger defensive position and consolidate your power somewhere and, and block the access to Vienna and southern Bavaria, but you're not going to do that. You're not going to seat ground that you already have. And, and again, trying to answer questions about what Hitler would do. I'm not a crazy man, so it's kind of hard <laughs> to answer that, right? 
I, just a quick personal anecdote to the question regarding the 56 revolution. In 1964, I was living in Naples, Italy, and the Navy doctor who delivered my baby um, had been in the revolution in 56. He was Hungarian. He, he left Hungary, uh, finished his medical training in the U.S., I guess, because he was in the U.S. Navy. His name was Dr. Near Jesse. N-Y-I-R-J-E-S-Y, uh, an obstetrician in the Navy, and I thought that was, I was always interested in that sure. in his background and wish I knew more now about his role, but I know he did play one. Thank you. Sure. I'm wondering, you know, just like our own World War II vets, there's, you know, unfortunately fewer and fewer every day. I'm wondering if you've ever had an occasion to interview either somebody who, uh, any of the Russians that were involved or any, any of the German soldiers that were involved? Uh, actually, no. I, I, I do Cold War history, and this is a, kind of a passing fancy. Um, as I've done some stuff on, on Hungary and the Cold War, I became kind of fascinated by this because it sets up a lot of the Cold War stuff. So if I ever get into World War II, maybe, but they're not around anymore, unfortunately, so probably not, which is why, you know, the value of this is phenomenal. And there's, there's significant Hungarian archives. The problem is they're in Hungarian, so I have to, I guess, learn Hungarian, which is a really easy language to learn. What are the relations today between Hungar Hungary and Germany and Hungary and Russia? Uh, well, right now the Hungarians are moving kind of right, by the way. Um, Hungary is a major t uh, tourist destination for both Germans and Russians. There's no great love loss between the Hungarians and the Russians, by the way, because of this, because there's a lot of raping, pillaging stuff going on, and then the 50-year oppression. Um, I think they're okay with the Germans as long as they're not Nazis, which is good. That, I think we have time for one more, right? I think there is a virtual uh, united economic, I mean, uh, industrial right. zone between Bavaria and, and yes. northwestern Hungary, just as with Bohemia, you right. see. The wages are about one-tenth, perhaps, of uh, one-eighth of, 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 Germ of German wages, right. you see. And so, in a sense, you have to think of this region economically, sure. at any rate, presently. Right. As yeah, and, and you're right, there's a, there's a link between kind of Vienna the old Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire, right? You have Vienna, Budapest, Prague, and then you factor in the Germans. It is kind of one cohesive economic Western-like zone, so naturally they kind, of, they kind of fit together. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Hope you enjoyed it.